You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. Mike, I'm super excited for this week's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. Now, I mean, I think everyone on our on our on our you know a guest of our show, I think everyone's used your platform. I think all our audience has used it as well. I, I'm pretty sure, you know, you're probably you probably have that one company that everyone has touched. So I'm not sure how much of an introduction we need to give, but can you give a little bit of your career? you know, going up to before Grubhub? Yeah, so uh, so before Grubhub, sure. I, I grew up in rural Georgia, the uh, feral youngest child of a single mom. Uh, made my way to MIT shortly after that. Um, had, a, had a single job in tech for as a software developer for a couple of years before I quit that. And in 2002, started, uh, started Grubhub in my apartment. Uh, started out as a neighborhood guide, just like... Uh, a subscription based well, isn't one subscription based. It was just a free neighborhood guide for delivery. Um, started to convert it into a business. Uh, sold a few a few um, subscription products, like subscription packages, for just like exposure, and then uh, pivoted into like an online ordering platform um, and marketing platform for independent restaurants, and then uh, grew it over the course of twelve years to a two point five billion dollar business. So. Uh, it was, uh, it was a pretty meteoric rise, uh, you know, it was sort of an overnight success, 10 years in the making. Uh, and then I quit all of that about, about 25 days after the IPO, I quit and, and rode off into the sunset. I, I rode, a, actually rode my bicycle from Virginia to Oregon, um, to get my head back on straight. And then more recently I wrote a book about it called hangry. And so that's why I'm talking to you today to talk a little about the book and a little about, uh, that experience. Now there, you had mentioned something that. It's very interesting. And, and you mentioned in the book about that those sales at the very beginning and just sales in general. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, the principles of sales? Can you maybe even share a story of when you use those principles to sell? Yeah. So um, right after I quit my job, so and you know, I quit my job. We, my business partner and Matt actually sold the first restaurant, but then then shortly after that, I quit my job to start going and selling. And I failed spectacularly. Like it was, it was not just like I stubbed my toe. Like I spent three weeks grinding away, trying to get that first sale for myself and I could not do it. Uh, and so I found myself in true entrepreneurial fashion at Borders Bookstore, which was a bookstore that existed back at the time, which no longer does. Uh, and I got a book, I got the manual. I, I, you know, like I'm a software developer. And so, you know, there's like the, there's like the pearl, like pearl for, for programmers book, right? Except I was like, well, what's the sales book? What's the sales version of that? Right. And uh, so I picked up that book in borders and it, it basically said um, all, well, there was a lot in it. There was a lot in this, this gem of a book It's called selling for dummies, but there was really three principles uh, that it talked about. And the, the first one is um, talk to your customer, understand like what their, what their challenges are, what their problems are. Listen. So step number one is listen. Step number two is Share with your, your customer, your potential customer, what it is that you do and how it can help them solve the problems that they just told you about. And then the third piece, and this is really critical, ask for the money. Uh, and so that's it. One, two, three, listen, share, close. That's it. Those are the three steps of um, sales. But what's, what was really interesting to me as in, in like was really early in that, in that process was every, almost everyone has this natural tendency to start with step two or three with either telling people what the product is and how it can help or with just asking for the money up front. And there's also a lot of people who actually just don't ask for the money, right? But very few people start with listening when you, when you start with sales. And, uh, and it was when I made that switch, when I switched from shoveling boatloads of information at a potential customer, just trying to overwhelm them with facts, when I stopped doing that and instead started with, hey, you know, like what's, what's the biggest challenge you have in, in your business as a restaurant? Like, how do you, like, what's your biggest challenge getting new customers? What, like what's worked, what hasn't worked? How much do you want more customers? You know, starting a conversation with really trying to find out where they're at. Um, that was, that's what really sort of turned things around. Uh, and then the other thing of course is, and this is in every sales book you'll ever read. If you don't ask for the money, it's just a friendly chat. It's not, it's not actually a sales conversation. You have to ask for the money. And it's awkward. It's really awkward to ask people for money. And so you have to get good at doing it. You just have to get reps in. I'm kind of curious how to get good. I mean, you said just get reps in, but 
I would guess there's people out there door to door selling all day long, morning to night, and still feel uncomfortable still when it comes to the ask. Is there any time that you that you can get over that that it becomes almost natural to to ask for that close, to ask for that money, or is it always linger in the back? So uh, when I say get the reps in, what I'm talking about is you need to get the reps in to get good at it, to get effective. I don't know that getting reps in makes you comfortable at it. That's a different goal. Uh, that's not the goal I'm shooting for. I'm not shooting to be comfortable when I'm selling people. I'm shooting to get business, right? And so uh, for me personally, it was always uncomfortable. It never got not uncomfortable. That's that's mostly true. It there were a few restaurants where I just really liked kind of going in and and like jabbering, like having some like real good conversations with with a few people who ultimately ended up becoming friends. Uh, but um, for the most part, I was always uncomfortable with it. And in fact, there's another point in the book where I say one of the reasons you might want to think about hiring people. There's really two reasons. One is if somebody else is better at it than you. But this was the second card category, which is if you just don't like doing something. Hire someone else to do it uh, because we tend to spend the least amount of our energy on the things we like the least and we tend to do the least good at them. And so finding people who are energized by those jobs uh, actually is a much better path than just beating your head against the wall. So the summary, like in summary, like I, I got comfortable by it about by having someone else do it who already liked doing it. So starting off, I mean, you were out there, you were doing the sales, you were going door to door. When is it time for a founder to switch from being out there selling the product themselves to having someone else out there selling it? Yeah, the thing that you learn with sales is you learn um, what it is about the product that people actually want to buy. And you can't outsource that at first. You have to do it yourself at first because there's really no other way to learn like what works in terms of the conversations, where the product should be going, what your customers actually value, all of those things. and. Uh, and so uh, it, that that's important at first. It, once you figure those things out, you really start to understand like how to make it more efficient, how to make it more cost effective, what the scripts are that work. And you can take those things and hand them to another person. And, uh, and that's really, I think, the transition point. The other thing you need is enough money, right? Like you have to have sold enough of your product to generate enough revenue to actually be able to pay somebody. Um, you know, one of the worst mistakes that a business can make is hiring salespeople on 100% commission. You you have to pay a salary and commission because um, if you're if you're selling on 100% commission, you really what you're getting is you're getting people who will arbitrage the 10 different things that they can sell and see which thing that they can spend the least effort on to get the most revenue out of. And instead of when you hire somebody as a full time employee with a salary, you get their dis their distinct attention on how to sell your product and how to get good at selling your product. And so um, there's a few things that sort of go into the prerequisites of being able to hire somebody, not least of which is, can you pay them? And, and a lot of startups, you know, the, the, the script out there, the thing that everybody talks about the way you're supposed to do it, you go to business school, you write a business plan, you raise a bunch of cash from a venture capital, and then suddenly you just have cash to pay a salesperson. Most businesses are not started that way. Most businesses are bootstrapped. Most businesses start with an entrepreneur who's who, who opens up a storefront or, or hangs a shingle, or in my case, started writing software and selling things. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's more typical. And so the, the cash available to hire people has to come from the operations of the business, not some magical investor dropping money on you. Speaking of the money coming from the operations of the business, there is one line in the book that when I read it, I just sat back and went, oh my gosh. And it was, the significance of a website that makes $1 versus $0. Can you share with us that? Yeah, so a website that's really beautiful with great branding and that has a legal, like, has a legal framework and a terms of service and you got a business license and it earns $0, that's a hobby. That, it doesn't matter how whiz-bang fancy it is, it's just a hobby. Until you make that first dollar, it's not a business. A website that makes money is a business, even if it's like a side hustle, right? And so there's a huge distinction. I, I think a lot of companies will spend a lot of time in product development and market research thinking about what they're going to sell without actually like going out and selling things to customers. And uh, and actually the revenue, the customers who pay you for a service that creates value is a much stronger indicator of um, your creating value, where you should go in the future. Um, it's, it's a real business. 
And then there's another step beyond that, which is when you can get a the same a a same customer to pay you again for your product because they valued it so much, then you know you've passed the threshold where your product is so valuable that people who already aren't just taking a chance on you, who actually know that it's valuable, want to re-up on that value. And so repeat purchase becomes an even stronger indicator of you've got a real business. Well, that's interesting about the the repeat, repeat client. It's odd in, you know, when we, in Silicon Valley, you'll see a lot of pitch competitions. You'll see a lot of people present. They'll talk about the number of sales, but you never see that, that, that one slide or that one promo of this is our repeat clients. This is our repeat customers. How valuable do you think that would be if they were to take it to investors when going out to fundraise? Grubhub sold to Just Eat for $7.6 billion. So it's valuable. <laughs> Uh, the, our average customer average was ordering 2.2 times per week, right? Like that's, it's a hundred and something transactions per year. So if you have to pay at the time when I started, it was like $6, but nowadays it's closer to $140. If you have to pay a, a fortune to acquire a new customer, getting them to order a hundred times is extraordinarily valuable. That's how you actually make a profit. And uh, at the time that we started, you know, it, the frequency wasn't nearly that high. Um, it, and, and the entire name of the game, both from, from the restaurant side and from the consumer side, was retention. How do, you, how do you create a product that's so good that people are loyal is sort of question number one. How do you make sure they stay with you for a long time for, for diners? But, but actually, the question that we were really trying to answer when we were going through our, our huge growth curve was, how do we get people to order more frequently? How do we remove the barriers to them order placing orders? And we made this transition where people would place orders once a month for delivery to going up to twice a week. And the reason was we removed all of the friction out of the ordering process. But more importantly, we, we used a lot of techniques to make sure the best food got to the, got to the customer the fastest. And, and that drove frequency, not just loyalty. And so, I mean, the repeat purchase dynamics, um, I would say probably 10 times more important than the, than the first cust like the customer acquisition strategy. Like I've always been surprised by this when I see pitch competitions that um, you might get a little bit of this when you see LTV to L LTV like long uh, lifetime value versus CAC consumer acquisition cost slides. They get to that a little bit. Um, but that's sort of like kitty math. It's not, it's not enough to just say LTV is higher than CAC. You really got to focus in on what retention, repeat purchase and cohort dynamics are. To really understand, like how, like how your repeat purchase behavior works. Can you dive deeper into cohort dynamics? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's like a fancy term. Okay, so what is cohort dynamics? Uh, I learned this um, probably when I was doing the Series B financing in our conversations with Benchmark and Sequoia, and and that's when we really started like leaning hard on on this concept. And basically, that the definition of it is. So for all the people who came in January of 2022, how do they behave? Like that, that group is called a cohort. They're, you think of them as a group. How do they behave over time? Like out of, if you said, like, let's say I have a product where 100 people bought in January of 2022. What number of them are buying in February, March, April, May, June, July? And you, you take that and you extend it out over several years. And, uh, and what you start to see is this pattern of, of behavior. You, you, out of 100 people ordered in January, you're never going to pass 100 again, right? Like you can't, you can't get 101 people who ordered out of the 100 that ordered in January. You can't get to 101. So the number is always decreasing. Uh, but you want to keep it as high as possible for a long time. And in a really healthy business, what you end up with is some amount of time after everybody has paced their initial purchase, you get like it kind of settles in. And out of that 100 people, let's say 12 of them six months out are placing an order. But it's this, and then another 12 is in seven months out and another 12 is eight months out. And it's a mix of the same people. But like what happens is you, you see who ends up being your long-term loyal customers. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that that trend, the decay of repeat customers, it gets better every year, right? So like in January of 2020, we had such and such dynamics for our customers. In January of 2021, our product got better. So they stuck around longer. And it's, it's like a pretty advanced way to think about re retaining uh, customers, but it actually is like enormously valuable in terms of being able to understand um, a million different things about the business. Is the product getting better? 
Um, you can use it to figure out like, oh, it turns out that the the people that came to our website from the cohort of people in January who came to our website from Google versus the cohort of people who came to our website from being referred by a friend, that second group repeat purchases at twice the rate the first group. So stop spending money on Google and start spending money on a referral program. So things like that is how you, how you use a cohort analysis. That's a real, you asked me to geek out before we started recording. That's a pretty, that's pretty deep, like, that's what cohort analysis is. Uh, we're, we're continuing down this rabbit hole. I'm, I'm Great. sorry there. Let's go. Okay. So early stage companies, how big of a, of a, a subject size do they need to be able to, to get the data needed to do these, do this analysis? I mean, if they're brand new company, they might only have you now 20 clients. If it's, uh, I mean, what's the smallest possible to get, get the data needed to do some analysis? So it depends on the type of business. If you've got a like B2B business, enterprise sales business where you're selling hospitals, you might only ever have seven customers, right? So like it doesn't help in that case. You know, on the other end of that extreme, there was Grubhub and the current business I'm running, Fixer, where we sell directly to consumers. Uh, and I can talk a little bit about Fixer because because I can answer this question with a specific antidote. Um, so I'll, I'll just jump in there right now. So Fixer is an on-demand handy person business. It's the thing that I've started um, more recently than Grubhub after I quit that and rode my bike across the country. And so we do we do we do fixes we do, we fix things do drywall and install install ceiling fans and switch out switches for dimmers and things like that in people's homes. Uh, <clears throat> the first, I mean, the first hour of that business, I had a friend who could fix anything, and I had five friends who couldn't fix fix anything, and I connected the two, and there we were, we we were in business, right? We made revenue, like while Katie was fixing Chris's shelves, I signed up for a Square account, and like. Charge the card. Like I literally made revenue. We made revenue in the first hour of the business, right? We started cohort analysis in the second hour of the business, right? Like, yes, we only had one customer. Yes, the sample size was one. But it turns out that he's actually pretty loyal. Like uh, he he stayed with us quite quite a while in terms of transactions. But we started setting up the framework right away because we're a consumer business and our sample size gets large quickly. Like by the sixth month of the business, we were up into the hundreds of customers. And then, you know, two years into the business, we were into the thousands. And so um, it, it, our sample size got big quickly, but it's actually even more important, I think, probably for SaaS businesses because you know SaaS businesses would typically have a subscription basis. Um, how long somebody sticks around on that subscription is entirely the name of the game for a SaaS company. Like that's the thing that matters more than anything else. And so, um, and so they should start this sort of on day one. Even if their sample size is low, they need to start thinking in that in those terms, right? Like, it not just is the product sticky, but is the channel I'm advertising the product on bringing in customers who find the product sticky because different advertising channels actually drive different repeat purchase dynamics, which is a thing most people maybe don't realize right away that like Google ads are probably one of the worst, like advertise, like in terms of retention, right? You might be able to get some, a customer for cheap, but do they stick around and do they repeat purchase? Not nearly as much as say, um, you know, referrals, for example. So with that, are there, because I mean, it, it sounds like there's so many lessons you learned from Grubhub that you've now are using with Fixer, but even before that. Yeah, just, that by the way is cheating and everyone should do it. Everyone should do it. It is so nice to not make shit up from scratch the second time around. So yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to dive, we're going to dive deep there. But even before that, just talking about, you know, from your lessons at, at Grubhub now Fixer, are there metrics that we're tracked in the past that you're like, you know, we shouldn't have been tracking these. These are our metrics that, you know, more companies should be tracking and paying attention to, like staying on the data topic. Yeah. Um, on the consumer side, the things that worked that were really important, um, I've got a great one. So rating, like we wanted to sort the restaurants that were best towards the top of the, towards the top of the listing, because the better the experience was for the customer, especially on their first order, the more likely they were to come back to us again and again and again. And so we wanted the best restaurants displayed that displayed to customers, which begs the question, what's the best restaurant? And the, the obvious answer is the restaurants that's rated the highest. And I talked through this, this example in the book with the, with the tale of two burritos, where I talk about the burritos from Garcia's and the burrito from, um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe the name, Car uh, Carbone. And uh, 
And, and the obvious answer is the one that's rated the highest. The one that's 4.9 stars is the best, is the best, re- the best burrito from the best restaurant. But actually that turns out to not be true. The best restaurant is the one where the, the person, where the customers reorder the same item the most times. So if somebody says they really like a steak burrito, that's good. But if somebody actually orders that same burrito 10 times, that's a better signal. And so I, I wish we would have, um, I really wish we hadn't even implemented a rating system for the food items. I, I think it was not relevant. I think we had a much stronger signal, which was the actual purchase behavior. And, uh, and by the way, this is why I hate net promoter score so much. I hate NPS. I hate it with a passion that's hard to describe. Wait, dive into yeah. this one. Yeah. I mean, literally in the last Here's week, why. I was at an event where they're like, what's your net promoter score? Like, Who cares what your yeah. net promoter score is? It, because what you're doing is you're asking people, would you refer my business, right? You know what a better question is? Would you please refer, refer my business? Here's a link. And measure the percentage of people who actually do it. Because it's driving actual revenue and value to your business. It's not a theoretical question. NPS is a theoretical question. It's the same issue that I have with um, market research, where you go out and you say, hey, I'm thinking about building this product. Would you buy it? Everyone says yes. Everybody says yes, because they're not actually putting cash on the barrel head. When you actually ask somebody to buy your product and they say yes or no, is a much stronger signal than asking what they theoretically would do. And so. Um, and so there's a theme among all these things, NPS, you know, uh, and referrals, actually asking for the sale is there's the concepts in here as well. Right. Uh, and then what we do around around what we did around rating a restaurant or rating uh, an item at a restaurant. I care a lot more about 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 customer behavior than a signal of customer intent that's less than perfect. I mean, if, if you only have say you're still at the idea phase. If you only have that customer intent, could you kind of weight it like maybe this is 0.6 or 0.7 to an actual order or an actual referral? Or, I mean, could you use any of that data, survey data beginning? Like how much weight could you put on that in your thoughts? So I don't think it's a relevant question. And here's why. (laughs) Skip the idea phase. Skip it. Just go right to the business. Like go right, make the thing and start selling it. Like I don't, this idea phase concept where you like, you, you sort of gestate an idea for six. I don't understand it. Like, why not? I mean, sure. I'm not saying don't, I, I'm not saying don't think about things, but you know, once you have a pretty reasonable, like, most, most startups don't start with like some huge research project. They start with like, damn it. I want a pizza. <laughs> I don't want to use the yellow pages or my new business. Like, why is it so hard to get a handy person to actually show up to my house? Like, they start with like a problem that the that the founder or the founding team experiences or sees in the world. And so the market research is already there. And so it's way better to start thinking about how to solve that problem in a unique way and then and then running rapid experiments. And this idea is explored a lot in like Eric Reese's book, uh, Lean Startup, like build a minimum viable product, see how customers react to it, iter- like observe, iterate, like keep going. And it's a way better idea than, man, has anyone ever gotten idea, gotten the idea phase right? Has anyone ever predicted like, hey, I'm going to build this product and it's going to be perfect? And then they were right. I don't know that I don't know that anyone ever in the history of businesses has actually succeeded with idea phase. And I was totally right about the product I was going to create. OK, so say you are past the idea. Say you've built something out, you've tested it. Things are going well. It's time to enter another market. What's the, the simmer strategy? Can you elaborate? And, and does that, is that still relevant? Can people still use it? Yeah, I mean, I, this is something I talk a little bit about. It, it, it sort of derives from, so the, what the Simmer strategy is this idea that uh, dollar for dollar going wider into many markets is usually more cost effective than um, spending aggressively to grow through marketing. That's, that's the idea behind the Simmer strategy that I talk about in the book. Um, and the, where it comes from is this idea that c- customer acquisition like the, the, or maybe customer adoption, getting customers to use your product. It takes three things. It takes a good product. It takes marketing dollars and it takes time. And you can sacrifice, you can spend more marketing dollars to decrease the amount of time that it takes to acquire X customers, right? 
Instead of taking two years, you can take one year to get, let's say, 2,000 customers. But what happens is, is it act, you actually drive go pretty quickly into diminishing returns when you start spending more on a per channel basis. Now, maximizing the number of channels you're on, being efficient, figuring out how to increase conversion rates, making sure that you try all the things that might work. That's all. Those are all good ideas. But once you do those things and you say, "Oh, I'm acquiring customers for eight dollars a eight dollars a a customer on Google or forty dollars, whatever the number is," um, if you try to double that number, you don't. Like if you go to eighty dollars and from forty to eighty dollars, you don't get twice as many customers. You got ten percent more customers for twice the cost, and so um, it makes more sense to instead of doing that. Let's say I had a food delivery service that was in Fort Worth, Indiana, right? Like it makes more sense to then go to Dayton, Ohio, and have and get exposure to more people searching across those Google search terms than it does to rank higher in the Google search terms that you're already in, and so. It, it frequently is the case that that wider reach actually can be more effective than than increased spend, and so that was the simmer strategy at Grubhub. You know, we 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 were growing at you know X rate year over year uh, in a single city, but we thought, oh well, we can just launch more cities to get our our aggregate growth rate for the company higher, uh, and it worked. But it, it's all based on this idea that there's diminishing returns in marketing, and so don't when it when an investor says. Well, what's the lever? Can I just put twice as much money on demand? Like the answer is, well, you're not the right investor for me. <laughs> Cause uh, just spend is never the it's it's like never the right strategy uh from a marketing perspective. And that segues us into this next perfect question. Okay, investor money, outside money coming in. At Grubhub, you went years without looking for outside investment, but then you did take it. What was kind of well, for our listeners that are early stage startups, what are some things they should be looking for when deciding it's time to start looking for, for outside money? What questions should they be asking the people on the other side of the table? What questions do you wish you would ask or are asking in the future? Yeah, I think that the things that you want to ask um, investors have very little to do with money. So the value that an investor brings to a business and, and, and with them a board of directors is that they can see your blind spots and they can tell you um, based on the patterns I've seen in the past, this might be helpful or that might be a good idea or that might be a bad idea. And so surrounding yourself with a board of directors that um, that really understands the strategy of what you're trying to do and has some domain expertise, is ex- it's an accelerant for the business. And it's more of an accelerant for the business than the cash is. And I think that that is... Um, I, I think it's hard to have that perspective because, okay, great, Mike. But if the bank still doesn't let me go below zero dollars. So like the cash is important. And I like, I get it. It's like a both and kind of a thing. Um, and so when, when you start looking for potential investors, um, you know, this, I mean, here's my process. I go on the website and I say, and I look, what's their thesis? You know, every, every investor I know is telling me that I need to differentiate. How do you differentiate? If they say they're founder friendly, I like, okay, all of you say you're founder friendly. I like, like, give me some proof points. Are you really like Founder Collective, a, a firm that invested in Fixer? They really are founder friendly, and it and it was clear from looking at their website and their proof points around the terms they put in term sheets, things like that. So there's this investigation that you have to do around: is the partner a right fit for your business? And and that means do they fit strategically? Do they have some domain expertise? They don't have to be great at everything, but they have to be good at something: marketing, product, sales, partnerships, enterprise sales finance, legal, they have to be good at something. Not They can't just be, they can't just be management consultants and finance heads. That doesn't work. And so they have to be good at something. Um, they have to be able to supply partners, uh, partnership connections. Uh, if you're, if you're a business that relies on partnerships or enterprise sales connections, if that's thing, they need to be able to supply access to other executives who might, you might end up hiring. Um, and then, you know, that that was all stuff that I knew about in Grubhub. This this time around with Fixer, you know, one of the things that we do is I have a spreadsheet of all of the VCs that we reach out to. And one of the columns in the spreadsheet is um, at the partner level. So excluding associates and principals and VPs at the partner level, what percentage of the partners are women or people of color? And if that percentage is zero, we don't contact them, right? We We will not contact a VC and we won't start a conversation with them unless they have at least one woman or at least one person of color that is at the partner level, not at like a lower level. 
and uh, this shock species. And it's like, it's 2022. Like, what are you doing? You had, you've had plenty of time to solve this problem for your firm. And so, um, and so that's been good. I mean, it's been, we've had representation all the way through the, the process of trying to find um, partners uh, who can be good for us. Um, and, and it's just a thoughtful, I mean, the whole thing I'm saying is it's a thoughtful approach that puts the money last. You're not just trying to maximize your valuation. You're trying to find the right partner who, who actually is going to be good for your business. That's interesting. And there's one thing that was mentioned. It was founder-friendly terms. Could you talk about in a term sheet, what would kind of be some founder friendly terms or, or red flags or things? I mean, especially now with the economy change and people are talking about how difficult it is to get VC funding, guessing probably some of the term sheets that are going to be offered are not as friendly as in the past, but people might not be aware if it's their first time. What are some founder friendly or terms that might be gotchas later on that they should be aware of? Um, yeah, I mean, this is. This is I'm you were starting to get beyond a little bit like my and, like and, just shoot and from no the legal hip with advice this. here or anything yeah. else like that. Uh, yeah, I think um you know, I think there are things where you're looking for um alignment from a from a timing perspective. Like is, it, are they gonna be patient while you like while you're going about while you're going about running the business, or are they like at the end of their fund and they have no more funds and they all kind of want to like retire? Like you want to look at sort of the longevity of the firm. You want to look at the um, sort of their funnel for like who they like to send Series B set sort of uh, uh, companies to, and like like what's their philosophy around that? Um, and um, yeah, I don't. I I'm, I think I mean may need to think about that question a little bit more about like like what besides a gut feel, what was it that made me realize that like some of these firms really really, really were founder friendly, and. Um, I don't know. I mean, like Founder Collective's website, like it's re it's really obvious. Like when you're on there, and, and it's funny because they all say it, but you can kind of tell which ones are just saying it. And I guess I don't really know what the specifics are that give me that gut feel. But I feel like when I go to websites, I make that snap judgment. So maybe I should be a little more explicit in my thinking about that. <laughs> how how important is trust in your gut? How has that served you throughout your your career? Mostly good, sometimes disastrous. <laughs> you know, I say to uh, I say to some sometimes I say. Uh, you know, making decisions without data is stupid. Making decisions without with data is smart. And making decisions in spite of the data is visionary. And uh, that's when it works. When it doesn't work, it's not visionary. It's just a disaster. So, but most of the time, um, you know, your gut is, your gut feel is informed by all the lessons you've learned to date, right? So if you take an approach of, I want to be learning constantly, I'm going to be open to correction, I'm going to be trying to find the places where I have blind spots over time, your gut feel ends up being pretty powerful. And you end up with, um, you end up with like rules. Like I have rules that I, I even have a hard time explaining. So one of them is, um, a lot of times in a business, you'll, you'll be thinking about, I need to hire a person, but I need this role so bad. I need these sales roles so, so bad. I'm going to go from having zero people. to like, I'm going to hire three salespeople. And I have this rule that's never go from zero to a number more than one of a role. Like, even if you need five customer service agents or 10 salespeople, hire the first one, give it a few weeks, see how it's working, then hire the second one. And I have a, and a related rule that if you, if you get down to like two people left for a role and you decide to hire one of them, and then later on you open up a second role, never go back to the person you didn't hire because there was a reason you didn't hire them. Right. And so like, these are gut feel like rules that I have, but they're, they're built out of, um, like logical things that I've like seen over the course of a hundred or 200 experiences. And so, I, I mean, I, I guess, um, to some degree, gut feel is, is in, it, it, it's informed by experience, but I also had that when I kind of didn't know what I was doing and it served me, it served me well. I mean, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it your gut feels great if, if you're, if you're educating yourself, if you're just ignorant and you're not interested in correction or learning or anything, your gut feels probably actually not that good. Has there been any time where you've maybe had a disagreement with the board or, or your team and by explaining, hey, my gut feeling is saying not to do this, but you haven't been able to put it into words? Yeah, I mean, there's the climax of the book is sort of centered around this idea of what's the right percentage to charge restaurants um, that, that does right by them, but that also generates a profit for us. 
And the public market's perspective, like the the John Q public, the the aggregate person that is the stock market, their opinion is charge as much as you can and bleed as much from that stone as possible. But they're short term thinking, right? And so long term thinking, you know, my my gut feel was, you know, you want you want the percentage that makes the restaurants most likely to stay in business for the longest period of time. You want to make them more profitable and don't push beyond that because um, the goodwill you generate from creating value for your customers, which for us in this perspective, in this case, what I'm talking about is restaurants. And like <clears throat> when you, you know, there's this exercise from the Toyota production method called five whys. We're like, you know, if you ask me like, why do I have that gut feel? I'd be like, well, because like, Doing right by your customers is good for longevity of the business. Well, why is why is longevity for the business good? And I'm like, well, because the value created for the shareholders and the stakeholders in aggregate over time is better. And I'm like, well, why is that important? Like at some point, I'm just like, I don't know, man. It's the right thing to do. Like, don't screw your customers. Like at some point, it really does come down to an axiomatic belief that is largely a gut feel, right? And uh, and Wall Street doesn't like that answer, by the way. They really don't. But, you know, like Bezos, whether you hate, love or hate him, his gut feel is do right by the customer, regardless of what Wall Street thinks. Right. And it's it served his business very, his businesses very well um, from the founding of Amazon on. Well, speaking of Wall Street, maybe let's talk about, I mean, you're one of the few founders that were there from day one to the company going public. How did... Going back to the gut feel, how did your gut feel when that conversation started to arise at the board level of, you know, maybe it's coming around time to take us public? What, how, how was that feeling? What was that like? That's a great moment. It was like, hell yeah. I, I like, it's one thing to talk about it with like your co founder and with your team, but when an, like an investor brings it up in a board meeting and you start planning for it, it's a, it like it's a goosebumps moment. It's it's magical. Like I started this thing in my apartment and we're going to be a public company. And that's like that's the finish line. Right. For startups. It's like the thing. This is the thing that always blew my mind is like I always thought as the finish line. But a lot of people actually see it as the start line. Like, OK, well, if you're going to go there, like actually keep running the business. Right. Like it's not necessarily the finish line. But for me, it was the finish line. And so I was really excited about it. Um, but I but I didn't know at the time uh, that. I probably we we the company probably could have created more value for for customers over a longer period of time if we'd stayed private. Um, that's my new, that's my new opinion. I might not have gotten paid as much at 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 a single moment, right? Like the investors and the shareholders might not have gotten as much cash, you know, on eight on May, May or what was it, April twentieth, twenty fourteen, right? I think is the date of the IPO, give or take. Actually, I know exactly that that's the date because it's a date that I'll always remember. Um, and so like, it was a really big moment in my life, right? I made, I made a great return on the business. Um, but I kind of wonder if there was like another path where we could have been in charge of our own destiny. We could have done right by restaurants more. We could have focused on independent restaurants and not go to chains. And it would have created more value for both for all stakeholders over time. And so, um, I often say like, everybody should, everybody should take a public, a company public once everybody should do it. I don't know that many people would do it twice. Um, I like the idea of this new business that I have, you know, Fixer, like we, we want to grow to be a very large multi-billion dollar business. We want to reboot, reboot trade education in the United States in a gender inclusive way. That's like a big goal. Like we're trying to become very large. Um, I'd have to think twice and, and really think about what going public would mean and what it would mean for the mission of the company. Um, and, and how much we're willing to say to wall street, like, I understand we missed our market, our quarterly earnings. I don't care. We're still on mission. So we're going to keep going the way we're going. And that's very, very hard to do. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's a nuanced, it's like a nuanced question, right? It's not good or bad. It's, it's a big change. And so you have to be thoughtful and intentional about that change. Well, speaking of that, I mean, right now, companies are staying private longer and longer. There's so much money in the private market. Do you think that well, I mean, it sounds like Fixer, you're going to attempt to keep it private as long as possible. I, do you, what are all the reasons why companies would want to stay private versus that finish line, that public, that, mm -hmm. you know, it's been so many dreams that you have so, to do once well, in your so first life. First of all, I, Fixer, 
may or may not go public or private. I haven't really considered that we're not big enough to really start thinking about it seriously. It's it what it's going to be is it's going to be an intentional choice, eyes wide open about um what the implications of that are. And I this is like this is the main theme of the book is is be intentional and understand what your personal goals are, right? Because if you if you have a personal definition of success, then uh, and it's not spoon fed to you by society or government or church or spouse or family or friends or whoever, right? Everyone will try and give you a definition of success. But if it's your own, if it's personal and it's unique and you've defined it and it's explicit, uh, it's a lot easier to hit that goal, right? And <clears throat> the the IPO the, the IPO really shouldn't shouldn't be a goal, right? Maybe maybe it's about getting a, a cash payout. Maybe it's about vanity and exposure. Maybe it's about having the capital that's available in the public markets to be able to get your mission. There's a lot of different reasons why somebody might go public. Um, and so it's really important that you have one as opposed to framing the question as, is there a reason not to go public? There's a lot of public discourse. There's a lot of discourse in like public media and in, in sort of business circles that starts with this assumption, this negative assumption, like, man, companies are staying private so long. But like that, that that statement assumes an ideal amount of time that companies should stay private, right? Because when you say it's so long, you're you're sort of implying that there's that it's like there's a, they should go public and there's an ideal time. But actually, that's like throw that framework out the window. The framework should be we are a private company and I need a reason to go public. It needs to support some other set of goals. Uh, it's not a default position now. Going public is a good way to get paid a lot of money. And so that's usually like the reason, right? That's usually the reason the early investors get paid bank, right? Like a big chunk of money. And that's hard to turn down, right? Um, and I talk about this in the book that like, for me, I had passed a threshold where I, I was going to be comfortable, but going public meant a lot more cash for the customer service agents and the sales salespeople and the software developers and the product people and all the people that the thousands of people that were working at the company got a big payday because of the IPO. And that was the thing that really motivated me to, to go for it. Um, it obviously also helped me. And so I don't want to sound like I'm entirely altruistic here. Like it was nice to get paid. Like every, like a lot of people like that. Um, and so, but I, but I just, the message I'm trying to give across here is uh, be intentional about what those, these kind of big choices. With this, with, you know, major choice, choices in your life, how does one really balance that that effort to cr hit a goal to that family relation to the to the friend relation how does one i mean here in silicon valley and we've talked about on the podcast in the past we've had founders come on talk about mental wellness talk about you know just be completely not balanced with their life especially different stages of their company's growth and how how were you able or what should founders and our audience think about for kind of those trade-offs while while they're building building their companies yeah i think um i think it's important to recognize that your company and you are not the same thing like you you like i as a founder have goals and those are distinct from the goals of my company and it's easy to forget that because being a founder especially in a startup hub is an identity, right? And so it's 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 hard to forget that that identity, it it's not actually true. Like we are separate from the companies that we build. And so the goals that we have for our lives and the goals that I have for my life should be more holistic than the goals for my company, right? Like like what I'm trying to accomplish as a person is is related but different than from what I'm trying to accomplish with the company. And I know how they're related. And both of those goals are explicit. And so um, that's the starting point is just understand how your goals may and may not be different. And I, I think it's also worth recognizing that even if your goals are pretty closely aligned and even if they're material in nature, which is okay, I'm not trying to have value judgment against that. Against that. If you want the company to make a lot of money and you want to make a lot of money, great. It's really important that that understanding is explicit. Um, a mistake that a lot of founders fall into. And I, and I started to, but like was able to correct this pretty early on is this idea of deferred life. I'm going to be miserable now so that I can be happy later. No one has ever achieved this, right? Contentment, the, 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 the goal of approaching contentment has to start in the present. It's never a thing that can just, you're going to 
you're not going to start that diet on Monday. Like it's, it won't happen. Like you'll get somewhere and you'll still be, um, you'll, you'll still be sort of miserable for, with this expectation of joy in the future. And so I think that combination of being thoughtful about a holistic set of goals and then being, being aware that you can find contentment and fulfillment in the present, even as you're working really hard at a thing. Um, th- for me, that's been the, the framework that has helped from a mental health perspective. I'm not saying I'm an expert at this. I have struggled. It was really hard running a business through the pandemic. Like, I, like it, this stuff is hard. Um, but th- that's the framework that I've used. I mean, in the book, you talk about riding your bike across America. How is riding a bike across America similar to maybe the journey of building a company? Yeah. So I talk a lot about goals, right? I talk a lot, talk a lot about vision and I talk a lot about intentional, intentionally knowing where you're going. And one of the things I talk about in the book that happens in the, in the grow up story is that when I start, my goal was to pay off my student loans. I had 260 grand in, in loans from MIT and my wife's, my wife went to BU and we had a, we just had a lot of debt that we had to pay off and it was crushing. And so I wanted to pay that off. We, we, I approached that goal. And I hadn't gotten paid yet, but it was pretty clear that the trajectory was that it was going to happen. And so then I was like, oh, well, I need a new goal. And my, my new goal became I wanted to have a business that helped independent restaurants, made them, made them thrive. That became my goals. That was not the business's goal. That was my goal for the business. Um, and then something similar happened on the bike ride. You know, af- the bike ride was after this crazy IPO process, all of the like investment bankers and all of the stress and it, private jets, but like 14 hour day, all the stuff that went into that. Right. And I was trying to like, I was trying to just get my head on straight and decompress from all of that and, and release some of the frustration and anger that was coming out of me and people around me. I wanted to just reset. So that was my goal to start. But actually halfway through the trip, I met a couple of people who became close friends and it became more about developing relationships over the second half of the trip than decompressing. And I think what I just described, this idea that like you set these intentional goals and then you come really close to hitting them and then suddenly they just fall flat. Like they're not enough anymore. And I think it's the cyclical nature of like the human story that when we set big goals for ourselves and we approach and we shoot for them and then we actually approach them we change. It changes us. The, 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 it's the nature of approaching goals that we, that we change it. And so then we need different goals and we move the goalposts. So like sort of the irony is I never actually hit my goals because I keep moving them as I get close. But the flip side of that is that I'm in, I'm content in the journey, right. In, in the process of trying to get there and, and then, and then redefining my, you know, I change. And so I redefine my goals. And so that that was a very similar process from the bike trip and the and the business journey. And crazy enough, it actually happened writing the book and it's actually happened starting the second business. So like I, I've seen this theme happen again and again. OK, and with that, I mean, before wrapping up, can you tell us about you know this new project you're working on? You mentioned it a little bit early on in the podcast, but tell our audience what this new endeavor is what you're going to accomplish, all that good stuff, the next you know, one, two, three years, or however far out that goalpost is kind of at right now that you know, will be moved later on. <laughs> yeah, so Fixer is, a, is an on-demand handy person service uh, where you can go online, book somebody to show up, and then we show up on time, do great work, clean up after ourselves. And the experience is what you'd expect. You have a phone, it acts as a remote control for your life, right? Sounds great. It's a little different than a marketplace because we employ the workers ourselves as, as W-2 full-time employees with benefits. And so it's not like a, a typical marketplace. And the reason we did that is that the supply of skilled tradespeople, there's just not enough people to do it. And so we said, well, if we, if we have a W-2 employee workforce, we can actually train people from scratch and increase the supply of skilled workers that are available to homeowners. Um, and it creates this great entry path into the trades where you don't have to have an uncle or a dad that teaches you. And it's always an uncle or dad. It's, it's never an aunt or a mom, right? Because the, because the trades have been so gender exclusive for so long. And so trying to create like an easy entry path into the trades and then create this great solution for homeowners is both a good business and it's impactful in the communities that we serve. And so it is, it is a social impact and also uh, uh, it generates a return. And so that that's the business I'm, I'm creating. My goal, our goal is to reboot 
my goal is to create a business that has both a a profit and a purpose that are both really good. It's not like a B team kind of business, right? It's like we're going to be a multi-billion dollar national brand, right? And and that's my goal is to create that business. The business's goal is to um, increase the diversity and skill of tradespeople in the communities we serve as we generate profit for our shareholders, right? And so, um, and so I'm really intentional about those two goals, right? And uh, and it's going really well. We're in five cities. We're in Chicago, Denver, Dallas, Seattle, and Phoenix. Uh, we, we're opening Minneapolis shortly, um, and probably a city in Ohio as soon as well. And so it's it's going really well. Um, sort of is I think going to be one of those ten years, you know, overnight success, ten years in the making kind of a thing because it takes a long time to scale up the operations of a business like this. But um, yeah, that's the that's the project I'm working on now. Oh, Mike, I can't wait to get you back on the show in ten years, but. I mean, the purpose of this show was also to promote your new book that's coming out November, I believe, November 2nd. Is that correct? Yeah, November 1st. So it should be out like as you're hearing this podcast. Uh, it's called Hangry. You can find it on Amazon uh, or on Audible um, if you want the audiobook. Uh, I narrated the audiobook myself, which everybody said I should do. So if you like my voice, great. If not, you should probably just go with the print version. Fantastic. We're going to have links to the Amazon page, all that in the show notes. So with that, everyone, contact us on the silicon valley podcast.com when i'm not the host of this podcast i am a mid-market investment banker focused mergers acquisition growth capital reach out to me sean flynn silicon valley sean flynn uh, sv on linkedin all that but i'd love to have a conversation but more than anything mike i want to thank you for your time this week on the silicon valley podcast yeah thanks for having me it was great